Support me on Ko-fi to see my videos early. The link is in the description or on my channel. There are a lot of potential criticisms that can be levied against Factorio, but one that I've never heard someone say is that it's too short. I think that it's too short. What if we were to say, make it a hundred times longer? My settings for this run are simple. We start with the real world preset. We then increase technology multiplier to 100. I divided all bite of evolution factors by 100 and increased the starting area size to 300%, which, trust me when I say, just about makes us equally powered with them. Immediately, this doesn't look much different from a normal run. We begin as always, building our burner mining setup to get a baseline resource income. Now it's time to address the elephant in the room. You've read the title and our thumbnail, so you know what's coming here. Every single technology requires a hundred times more science packs than usual. So a technology that usually needs 10 red science packs now requires a thousand. And the rocket technology itself requires more science packs than it takes to unlock the entire tech tree in a normal game. This is not all strictly true, however. Due to the Factorio devs having some mercy, and the frank ridiculousness of having to spend 92 minutes handcrafting red science packs to unlock automation, the automation tech is immune to the multiplier, so we only need 10 red science packs to get assembly machines. No other technology in the game gets this concession. So, obviously it isn't sustainable to be handcrafting red science at any point from now on, so we go straight into some industrial scale hand feeding. One gear assembler will be enough to feed these 10 red science assemblers, and we have them all set up nicely in a row to make it as brain dead as possible to hand feed. In a normal run, this kind of level of production would carry me through to a rocket launch, but in this run, it's hardly enough to get logistics researched in a lifetime. Which means I'll have to build another one, right next to it. In retrospect, I could have automated delivery of the gears, but then where would I fit the suffering which seems mandatory with every Factorio challenge? So anyway, we have a lot of science now, and one lab will not be enough, we need a lot of them. With no beacons, modules, or research speed upgrades, you will see that the number of labs required to consume all of the science we will produce gets ridiculous quickly. Still researching logistics, we have 20 labs going, and I'm not actually convinced it's consuming all of the science I'm producing, though I never actually checked. I also begin running the numbers for how many materials I need for 1200 red science per minute, which I thought was a good amount, and I think it's feasible for me to just build outright as soon as logistics is researched. I begin setting up the smelting stacks. I'm going to need a little under three lanes of iron and a little over one lane of copper. So I settle with four of iron and two of copper to save some extra for a small mall. It's around this point I realised the degree of carpal tunnel compression I was going to experience if I hand placed everything from now until bots, which will be a long time. So I downloaded Ghost Placer Express which I think is the least cheaty of the early game blueprint placing mods. For anyone who hasn't used or heard of it, when it's turned on, any ghost I have in my cursor over will be automatically placed if I'm within arm's reach and I have the item in my inventory. Soon, the logistics tech finishes, so I can finish building these furnace stacks. It's a design as old as time, so I won't show you the process, but here's the finished result. You can also see the ghost placer in action here. The first thing I do is set up some automated gears and belts, which will be useful, because we're going to need a massive amount of them. I then set up circuits. I don't need them for red science, but I'll want some for the little mall I'm going to build. To begin with, I just build yellow and red inserters in the mall, but I'll expand it as I see fit. Then, we have the most important bit, the red science itself. I build this little module, which on its own can produce 120 red science per minute, so to reach our target, we're going to need 10 of these. After that, we have the labs. It is going to be a constant battle throughout this playthrough to have enough of these to keep up with production, since the game simply wasn't built around having this much science production this early on. We instantly get back to building more red science setups, as the faster we get this up and running, the faster we can get through the early sciences. User Alp on my Discord correctly guessed the challenge for this run from the photo of this setup alone. So shout out to them for that. If you aren't in my Discord, you totally should be. It's where I post all of my updates about videos, as well as just hanging out sometimes. 
around this point, I realise I'm going to have to go on the offensive or defensive at some point, as the biters will not ignore me for much longer, so I get rifle magazines automated. At my tech level, I have very little options for attacking bases, so unfortunately, I must submit to the cheesiest of cheese, the turret creep. Here's what that looks like. I'm sure there are many colours of paint you'd rather watch dry than seeing me turret creep with poor natives a thousand times, so I'll skip over most of it. But rest assured, this is a constant issue I face, because unless I want to build defences, I will need to be going out and clearing biters constantly to stop my pollution cloud covering them. Thanks to the real world preset, the nests will not expand, so every nest destroyed is a permanent upgrade to my available land. I'll give you all of the deets now, so that I don't have to rehash this later. Yes, I am using the expansion indicator to find nests. Yes, it is cheating. No, I don't care. This run is already going to take a hell of a long time. I don't need it taking any longer than it needs to. As far as I'm concerned, the real challenge for this run is the scale, so I want to spend as little time bogged down in the minutia as possible. After a lot of going out and clearing nearby nests, it's time to get back to the task at hand. We return home and build more red science setups, making that 4 and getting us to 480 science per minute. However, as you can see here, we are very backed up on red science, meaning we need way more labs to actually make use of the production we have here. I finish off the 5th red science setup, so we're halfway to the goal I set of 600 science per minute. I realise that this lab design isn't going to work as soon as I want to add another science pack, so I have to pick up all of this bottom part and move it further along. The array is so large now, I can't fit it all on one screen, so enjoy seeing most of it in action. According to the Factorio cheat sheet, we need 1200 labs to consume 1200 science per minute if the research time for the technology is 60 seconds, which is obviously infeasible, so we aim for 300 for now, which will fully consume our current 600 science per minute if the research time is 30 seconds. To this end, I automate labs. Yep, that's right, all of those labs were handcrafted. No, I will never recover. This is our base as it stands currently. As you can see, we have plenty of leeway when it comes to pollution, as the cloud is nowhere near even the possible expansion chunks, never mind the nests themselves. It's a good job too, because we aren't doing nearly enough mining to satiate a 1200 science per minute base, so we will need to expand to this iron and this coal. At some point, I realised that to play through this entire game at normal speed could take a very long time, so I decided that the only answer was to bend time to my will and maybe save a few dozen hours off my life. To this end, I installed time buttons to allow me to speed up time at the click of a button, especially useful for the increasingly long walks between exterminating nests, and as a nice bonus effectively pentupling my science per minute in that time. Just look at that research bar. It almost felt like a normal game for a moment there. A quick reminder of the absolute dirt I get up to when the camera's not rolling. Something I hadn't shown up to this point was the absolutely insane amount of steam engines required to power this base, which, might I remind you, has never even felt the touch of a green science pack. And it's around here that I change tune and decide to fix that. Up until now, I intended to make 1200 science per minute of each science, but spoilers, this is all getting torn down once I've unlocked trains and the Cybersyn technology, so I thought screw it and pivoted. We could use our infrastructure for 1200 science per minute of red science, but we could also use it for just barely 480 science per minute of red and green science, so I decided to do that instead. This will take the form of two 240 science per minute green science modules, the first of which I'm building now. If you can see what I've done wrong here, you're a lot smarter than I am. Whilst the research finishes for green science, I engage in more skirmishes against the locals. I'll give you one last chance to see it. Yep, every single inserter is the wrong way around. I make the decision here to buffer green science, because I still have some red sciences left to do, and technically, my red science production is 600 science per minute, so the extra green will get used. I can now introduce this green science into my lab build. The problem I'm facing now is that I need more resources to actually feed this factory, but I need more power to feed the miners. But my coal patch's entire production is almost being used. The first thing I do is expand my power plant to have a second row of boilers and steam engines. 
Mining this coal patch is next up on the agenda. It's going to be a while before we can research any other power sources, so I suspect we're going to melt through quite a few coal patches before this one is over and done with. I connect it to my original coal patch with priority splitters set up, so it prefers to draw coal from the starter patch before this new one. With some of the spare coal kicking around, I ought to make grenades to help clear nests and forests. Our poor starter iron patch can't possibly produce enough resources to feed the base, so we set up a mining outpost on this massive iron patch to the southwest. For some reason, despite me having just automated grenades, I insist on ripping through this forest manually. With that connected up, our base can theoretically support 480 science per minute of red and green. All that's left to do is build the other green science module. After waging war across the southern part of the known world, I return to clear out space for the second green science module. With it built and connected up, our base is now producing science at 480 per minute, so I think it's about time we bring this episode to a close. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time. If we want to get anywhere near 480 science per minute of black and blue science, this power plant simply will not do. In a series such as this, you'd likely expect less of a base and more of a mega base, so it's time for me to build my first mega build, a massive coal plant. Now, handcrafting boilers isn't so bad, but I'd rather eat my own hands than use them to craft 240 steam engines, so I get that set up in the mall. Any sensible and supposedly skilled Factorio player would have a massive mall set up by now, but I'm stubborn and quite certainly very stupid. Here's a map of the known world. When deciding where to build my massive coal power plant, I basically only had one consideration. Where's all the coal at? I decide that over here is a good place because it's slap bang in the center of three sizable coal patches. The problem, however, with this plan of action is that it's very close to our current borders with the local fauna and we all know they can't resist the scent of burning coal, so we'll have to rehome them far away. Now, I know last time I didn't want to show any of the battles against the writers, but I spent so much time doing it this time, I'd have no video left if I didn't. Worry not, it actually has some relevance this episode. So far, the turret creep is working, even on quite large nests, but once we get a bit further out, we're going to start seeing medium worms, and at this point, I was worried what they would do to my archaic strategy. We get our first taste of them against this nest near the northeasternmost coal patch. As you can see, the turrets get absolutely obliterated by them, whilst doing very little damage in return. It's clear something is going to have to change. That change can come later, however, as I choose to leave them for now and get to work on the power plant. I clear out a chunk of forest here so that I can build it close to the water, and with over a hundred boilers in hand, I start laying down the plant. We'll start smallish for now, but I expect I'll have to expand it massively as we increase production. A single water pump can feed 20 boilers, so the plant is 20 boilers high, and we're going to build 6 sets of 20 boilers, for 120 total, which provides enough steam for 216 megawatts of power. It's worth noting that a yellow belt can't actually provide enough coal for 40 boilers in a row, but by the time that's a problem, we'll likely have red belts, so we can fix that. With the first stack all set up and ready to be brought online, it's time for the most essential part, the coal. I choose to start with this patch over on the right, since it's large and not as close to the biters as the one up top. Soon, the coal reaches the plant and we are in business. I will build the other two when either we need it, or I'm bored of whatever else I'm doing and need something simple to do. One resource which comes at an absolute premium in this challenge is land. We need land for two things, the first obviously being to fit the humongous factory we want to build, and the second to absorb all of the pollution that that factory produces. Now, land covered in biters is obviously good for neither of those things, so we're going to have to start finding ways to keep the war machine going in spite of the medium worms we're starting to encounter. My solution is to split the iron ore five ways instead of four, and take the extra lane, as well as copper from this newly exploited patch, 
and use them in a micro factory to produce red ammo. I also take any spare steel from this process and stash it away for any crafting I might need it for in the future. I decide to take a temporary research detour to unlock landfill which, spoiler, is probably a total waste of time. My thought process was that I will need it when I progress to the rail mega base, but I'm still over 200,000 science packs away from that even mattering in the slightest. Remember when I said I'd work on the power plant when I was bored? You should, because I only said it a minute ago. Well, that time has come already, as it's going to be a while before enough red ammo is accumulated to make a fighting run worth it. I dirtily automate pipes here, and then get down to some building, which is quite easy with Ghost Placer Express. That puts our potential production up to 281 megawatts. 216 of that from this setup alone. Whilst I did that, we produced 1160 red ammo, so I decided to take it for a spin. Our first target is of course those two medium worms that caused us trouble earlier and it fucking melted them. Fantastic. And a nest with only small worms stands no chance. We quickly reduce it to dust across the sands. Here's the real test. A nest with mostly medium worms. How well this works basically makes or breaks the run as we're going to run out of space quickly if we can't push through the medium worm nests. We ourselves take a lot of damage, skill issue if you ask me, but the turrets absolutely rip apart the nest so I can pretty safely say the run is not dead. With this knowledge, I run back to grab some more ammo and get back out there into the world to exterminate more nests. We clear out a lot of nests on this right side here, since it's so close to our power plant which is likely going to be the most polluting structure in the entire base for a long time. These attacks aren't cheap however. You can see from me cleaning up the aftermath here that quite a few turrets get destroyed and the ones that are left usually have very little ammo in them. Every time a turret gets destroyed we lose whatever ammo is left so we are burning through ammo quite quickly as well as turrets. Also it takes a hell of a long time to repair everything and pick it all back up. Anyway, I spend about 15 minutes running back and forth and end up clearing land up to here, which is good enough for now. Anyway, initially my plan was to work on blue science next, but I started to realise that I'm going to need to clear an even larger amount of space still for that to work, so I decide to start on black science instead to make the clearing process easier. Not only will it give me access to defender robots and flamethrowers, but also better damage upgrades which will be essential if we start to see medium biters, and even later, big biters. This iron and this copper patch are perfect candidates, and we will bring them up here, where we can use this coal and these two stone patches, bringing them all together finally in this area, where the actual factory will be. All in all, we need two yellow belts of copper, four of iron, six of stone, and three of coal. I fill my inventory with transport belts and get to work. You may be asking, why bring copper from all the way down here when there's a big patch right there? This is the part where I should have some very smart answer to that. But the truth is, I was asking myself the same question later on. So, I build belts from the iron and copper, having to build a little chicane around these cliffs. God, I can't wait for cliff explosives. We then rip a hole through this forest before finally getting the belts to what is essentially their final destination. Whilst we're here, I quickly lay out how the furnace stacks are going to be, four for iron and two for copper. I then go plan out the stone smelting, which will be a group of six stacks. Because it takes two stone to make one brick, the stacks can only be half as tall, and each will make only half a belt of stone brick, for a total of three belts. Building furnace stacks is good and all, but they're useless without resources to feed them, so I go and focus on that first. Earlier, I set up a little landfill plant on this stone patch, but it's an absolute waste, so I quickly repurpose it for the black science setup. This is only getting us four lanes of stone, however. We'll have to get the other two from the smaller patch on the left. I get the six furnace stacks together before going to set up the other stone mine. Back at the furnaces, I route in all six lanes of stone. Next up, we need coal, both to fuel the furnaces and to build grenades. Both of these patches are good candidates, so I decide 
to take both. I'll start with the one nearer my base, from which I'm taking three lanes, two for grenades and one for fueling all the furnaces. The splitter book I have really saves my ass here, because I have no idea how that kind of thing works. When copying these stacks, I very foolishly didn't add the core input, so I'll have to do it by hand now. As you can see, I absolutely butcher it. Next up is, of course, the iron and copper smelting stacks, which required a quick bit of clearing, and there is the finished result, because I trust that you will be as sick of watching me build furnace stacks as I am of building them. Now, I think that the northern end of my pollution cloud is much too close to uncharted and most likely biter filled territory, and that is only going to get worse once I finish the setup and turn it on. So it's time again for some biter clearing. We stock up on red ammo and gun turrets and get on our way. And the thing about having so many turrets is that your potential DPS is nearly uncapped, providing you don't run out of turrets, ammo, or space to place them. Watch me melt this entire nest in 20 seconds, for example. I actually spend, on average, like four times longer cleaning up afterwards than actually attacking the nests themselves. We absolutely tear through most of the biters near our northern pollution border and find a massive copper patch along with a quite modest iron patch which seems to be entirely forested over, something you don't see very often. Then I go and start setting up the massive iron mine for black science. The actual amount of miners required to finish this is ridiculous so I don't place it all down now, but I make sure to put down all the power poles to make it as easy as possible to finish later. We also connect up this copper patch, leaving very little left to do before we can get to the meat and potatoes of this episode, the factory. I get it all connected up to power and, oh my, look at all that pollution, so close to what is essentially biter territory. I think I was a bit premature with putting down my weapons. We have some more work to do. So, being the robotomite I am, I go and build more miners, finishing off both patches which increases the pollution output massively. Finally, I get out there and start fighting. In my hubris, after levelling a dozen nests, I let my guard down and get melted by some worms. I rush back to get my stuff and finish the fight, but in the meantime, I lose over 50 turrets, and with that, hundreds of ammo. To make matters worse, my body blends in perfectly with the piles of corpses and destroyed turrets, making a sort of where's Wally situation where I need to find my corpse before I run through worm fire to grab it. My biggest problem right now is water. I have so much land captured that it's absorbing all of the pollution my factory is producing, but water is terrible at absorbing pollution meaning nests on the shore can be polluted quickly, even before closer land dropped nests. For this reason, I am planning on clearing nests on this massive lake to the southeast, much further back than their counterparts inland. I end up going quite far in, but I'll eventually have to come back and clean up the entire shores of the lakes surrounding my base. It's finally time to put all of these materials I've spent the last three hours preparing to use and get this black science build done. First up, we need 8 wall assemblers, which I thought was a surprisingly small amount for 480 science per minute, especially compared to what we'll need to build for the other two ingredients. Since we have 3 belts of stone bricks, I settle on 3 sets of 3 wall assemblers, so I can skim off the extra production if I end up needing to build defences sooner than I expected. I then set up the rest of the coal mining for grenades, before combining our two coal sources into three lanes. Also, one and a half lanes of this iron need to be turned into steel, so we can pull that right off at the start into these three half stacks. It would be tempting to fuel them with this coal right here, but that's for the grenades, remember. We have a dedicated fueling lane down south. With steel finally producing, we're now two thirds of the way to the next black science ingredient, red ammo. All we need now is to build the yellow ammo, which is not quite as difficult. What's left of that second iron lane is about enough to feed three yellow ammo assemblers, and the rest comes from the next lane. Then, we just combine two lanes of copper, and a split lane of the steel and yellow ammo in this quirky little build, and that's us two thirds of the way to black science. The next ingredient is the biggest pain, 
both in design and scale. We need 64 grenade assemblers, so I decide on 3 sets of 22, but my aim of compact, neat little designs comes into conflict with my wish of designing them easily. Each assembler needs 3 times more coal than iron, which is ok on the left because the coal is on the near side so we can use fast inserters, but on the right, coal is on the far side so we need 2 red inserters to keep up with demand, leaving no space for a power pole. I end up with this design, with undergrounds on the iron belt to fit the power poles. This is probably the first time that this mode has presented me with a problem that isn't just having to build at scale as this could easily be done with medium power poles, but researching them would be a massive waste of time right now. I realise around here that my starter copper patch is quickly running out, but I slap a band-aid solution on and firmly mark it as a next episode problem. Anyway, so we have a third of the grenade production we need, all that's left is to copy it twice. We bring it all together here and get to building the whopping 80 assemblers we're going to need to produce all the science. Although it looks familiar, it's way easier than the grenades because we only need one red inserter on both sides. Here she is in action. Although these sort of zoomed out overviews of ridiculously sized early game builds are probably what a lot of you are here to see, I'm terrible at remembering to do them. Now the best thing to go with stupid big science production is stupid big science consumption. This area looks like a pretty good place to do it. No cliffs, and right next to our military science too. It's almost like I planned it. I didn't. So, 480 science per minute. No lab speed upgrades. No beacons, no modules. Worst case scenario, a single research step takes one minute. That means we need 480 labs. So I plan out 600. Seriously, I don't know what was passing through my head besides empty air. To make it worse, it's only going to get more overkill as we do start getting lab speed upgrades. I start placing down all of the labs that I had accumulated in my mall, but it wasn't enough to finish the setup. Whilst I wait for more to craft, and don't worry, I haven't forgot about my old setup I can salvage, I place down all of the inserters and power poles. I do eventually finish all of it, and the only thing left to do is bring in the science. It is true that this setup only has space for 4 science packs, but once we get blue science, the nature of the game changes entirely, so everything we've built becomes irrelevant anyway. So, I think it's about time we turn it on. After hours of working on it, that felt damn good. Unfortunately, it won't all saturate, because our current research only takes 30 seconds per step, so less than half of the labs are needed. Anyway, on that bombshell, and having just passed the 12 hour mark, I think it's time to bring this episode to a close. Off camera, I did a bit of work. I spent a few hours clearing out biters to make enough space for blue science, out until I started seeing big worms, which are a bit too strong for my current tech level. I'm liking the look of this area down here for the setup itself, as it has two oil patches, as well as iron, copper and coal, and some extra patches over here if we need them. You will notice, however, that it is exceptionally close to the nearby biter nests, which, as discussed earlier, have a pain to get rid of. And given that this is probably going to be bigger than the entire rest of the base combined, we're going to need a way to deal with all the pollution we will be producing. So, I head up to the black science build, and draw some resources off the bus, with priority splitters. Basically, when we aren't researching using black science, we want the excess resources to go to this setup. I set up green circuits, and a little bit of oil processing. Most of you probably already know where I'm going here. We make plastic with coal off the fueling line, and then bring it all together for a little red circuit build up here. The goal of course, is efficiency modules, and all of this is enough for 6 assemblers making them. I start setting it up, and where are my efficiency, efficiency modules? modules? Yep, I never even researched them. I get them queued up, and get to work elsewhere whilst we wait for it to research. In a normal playthrough, that would just be a silly goof, but in a run like this, it is easily wasting dozens of minutes of my life. I get in my brand spanking new car, filled to the brim with belts and inserters and buildings, and head out to the site where I'm going to build the blue science. Due to the hiccup with efficiency module production, I decide to build the entire thing before I connect it to power, to prevent the full stink of the miners being unleashed on the locals. 
This will prove to be a mistake, as it makes it near impossible to identify and fix problems. Anyway, we start with the coal patch because, I don't know, you have to start somewhere. It's a massive patch, but we actually only need less than two yellow belts of coal. So we use this balancer to shrink it almost comically. I then realise I need a belt to fuel all the furnaces, so I delete that balancer and use this 8 to 3 one instead. Anyway, I just used all my miners on that one patch, so I'm moving on to basic resource processing. We are going to have 6 furnace stacks for iron and 4 for copper, and then a further 3 for steel, coming right off the iron stacks. I didn't actually bring enough furnaces or power poles to finish this off, so we had to make a quick trip back to the base in the middle, but after 20 minutes, they're all done. Because 6 belts is probably a bit too much to get from a single patch, I put down this 8 to 6 balancer and we will take 4 belts of iron ore from 2 separate patches and combine them into the 6 we need. Around this point I realise that I'm actually dumb as bricks. For 480 blue science per minute you need 6.4 belts of iron. 6.4 belts. My brain must have just automatically chopped off the 0.4 but it makes a difference so I'll have to stick another stack on the end here. Technically, I could get away with just a half stack, but that would look dirty, so I'll go with a full one. The efficiency module research finished whilst we were working, so I go set the recipes in those assemblers to start production. Talking about efficiency, I bring all these resources into a little bus here. I'm one of those Factorio players. If my base doesn't look like a CPU layout, it makes me sad. Our first intermediate product we're going to get out of the way is green circuits. We need only 24 assemblers for these, which I'll break into two sets of 12. I've put this first because it's going to use up over half our copper and a quarter of our iron, so we can shrink the bus down straight away after this. I use these weird belt machinations to draw resources off the bus for... Reasons I can't entirely remember. I used to do it like this a long time ago, and I guess it makes sense because it draws evenly from the entire bus. If I'd done it right. There should have been a splitter right here, I believe. So that's the green circuits done, but I of course can't show you it in action yet because of the lack of power. Now, there's an oil field right in front of where I want to put my bus, so we have to turn the bus to the right here, as well as shrinking it down. The first blue science ingredient we're going to produce is red circuits, of which we need 144 assemblers. Now that's more like it. A lot of people will ask why I'm using yellow belts, stone furnaces, tier 1 assemblers and such, and my answer is quite simply just that it makes the builds bigger. But progressing into the next stage of the game after blue science, I will be using higher tiered buildings, rest assured. Here's a red circuit module containing 24 assemblers, so all we need now is 5 more of these, and thanks to Ghost Place of Express, that's as simple as just copying it 5 times. Ghost Placer makes the game bearable, but I'm positively ecstatic at the idea of getting bots soon. Soon, of course, having a very different meaning in this challenge compared to a default settings run. Anyway, with that setup done, we're a third of the way to blue science. Next up is of course engines, which I want to try to fit into a similar footprint as the red circuit setup, so we can copy paste them right next to each other. In total, we need 160 engines, so I'll break it into 8 blocks of 20. I really like how these turn out in the end. This is probably one of the cleanest factories I've ever built. A factory does not a blue science make we also need to get resources to put into it. I start with this conveniently placed iron patch, before heading up to restock my miners, as well as pick up some efficiency modules to put into the mining fields. Efficiency modules are kind of ridiculously overpowered when it comes to biters, as a massive amount of your pollution comes from mining, and it lets you just cut that down to a fifth. We also go to connect up this copper patch. I'm not 100% sure that it will be enough to handle the demand of the setup, but worst case scenario, we get a bit less than 480 signs per minute for now, and I can claim a nearby patch with a tank I'm hoping to get in the near future. I'd like to bring your attention to this graph, which says that spitter spawners are consuming pollution, yet we don't seem to be getting attacked. Well, something I didn't point out last video, is this island in the middle of the lake over here, which is graciously acting as a massive pollution vacuum. 
for absolutely nothing in return. Since I doubt we will ever be running critically low on uranium, I'll happily leave it there forever. Anyway, we've got no more convenient iron patches nearby, so I'm going to have to go far afield for the next one. There are some iron patches nearer than this one, but they're even closer to bite us. So close, even the efficiency modules can't help. So I begin the massive trek to this other iron patch. I have to restock belts three times on the way there, and once there, we quickly slap it down and fill it up with efficiency modules. I park my car on the belt, so it's slowly delivered back to the base, whilst I place down the hundreds of small power poles required to connect this to the rest of the setup. I intercept the car about a third of the way back and go to prepare to collect and process the final material. We need thousands of pipes, quite a lot of steel and tons of green circuits. I'm of course talking about oil processing. Because of how abjectly bollocks basic oil processing is, we need 34 oil refineries to provide enough petroleum for our needs, and probably most of the output of the two oil patches to feed that. Have I ever mentioned how much I hate setting up oil patches? I hate setting up oil patches. I get to work building the oil processing area, which, due to the fact we aren't intending on upgrading to advanced oil processing, is almost disturbingly easy to build. Look at this for more than three seconds, and tell me it doesn't make you feel deeply deeply sick. I connect up the other patch and now we just need to set up the actual IO products we need. For all of this setup we've done, the actual number of chemical plants we need are surprisingly small. 12 for plastic and only 2 for sulphur. The sulphur part is most shocking to me, so I build 4 instead, just to settle my mind. So, all that's left now is to bring our three ingredients together, slap them in a bottle, sharpie it blue, and ship them off to the labs. We need a whopping 192 assemblers. So I, with not one, but two maths A levels, copy down two sets of 80 and call it a day. Looks pretty cool though, even if it is wrong. I route in all the resources we need, and then start the arduous process of bringing the packs over to the lab setup. I think we're about ready to turn it on. Try to enjoy, between the absolute pain caused by my incompetence,
thank you all for watching. A mega base deserves a mega mall, and so do I, because I'll probably be here for a year if I wanted to handcraft it all. Up until this point, I've been using crappy buildings, stone furnaces, yellow belts, yellow inserters, tier 1 assemblers, the works. But I think it's about time to upgrade to less crappy, but still not entirely mega base worthy, buildings. Between episodes, I did some work, clearing out this massive area for the mall, killing a ton of biters, and setting up new resource patches, including connecting a closer iron patch to the blue science setup, which frees this one right next to the mall for us to use. I've left the big iron belt still, because I'm going to use half of it to transport two belts of coal I need for the mall up here. A quick note on biters, with the increasing size of nests as I expand outwards and the ever-growing presence of blue biters defending them, clearing nests is becoming a painful job. I could just build a perimeter like a normal person, but I had a more devilish idea. What if we made a stealth mega base? This would consist of putting efficiency modules in absolutely everything and switching our power over to either solar or nuclear, which, if we do it right, could result in the final mega base actually producing less pollution than our base as it is now. Of course, without speed modules, the base would be absolutely massive, but that's what we're all here for, right? In an effort to actually get shit done today, I had myself this little checklist of stuff I needed to automate to make my megabase into a reality. I should note now that although I'm saying the word megabase because it sounds good, it's actually only going to be a 480 science per minute base, so I suppose it should be called a 480 kilo base? Megabase is a bad name anyway. Mega meaning million suggests that it's a million science per minute, when the mega actually refers to the temperature of your CPU trying to run it. Anyway, whilst I've been rambling, here's all of our solid resources ready to be processed. My first part of call is green circuits, and then a mini mall to expedite the construction of the mega mall. It does actually, however, contain the assemblers for miners and blue assemblers, so there's two items off the list. I said we had all of our solid resources, but we were of course missing out on everyone's favourite dinosaur juice. Here you can see my partaking in my favourite, favourite, favourite activity ever, setting up oil patches. I then process the oil, and most importantly, get lubricant set up. It's always the best part of a game, because as soon as you see the green liquid flowing, you know bots will not be far behind. It's time for red circuits, followed closely behind by engines before we get around to another item off the checklist, efficiency modules. At this point, I was thinking that I would be using productivity modules as well as efficiency, but later on down the line, I will end up turning these productivity module assemblers into efficiency module assemblers as well. I'll quickly run through the next couple, as to not bore you. We build rails, a lot of train related stuff, all types of yellow and red belts, robot frames ready for both types of robots once we finish researching them, electric furnaces, and I set up assemblers for robo parts and stack inserters ready for their respective research is finishing. I set up power poles, and finally solar panels and accumulators, which we will be using to power the base. According to Kirk McDonald's fantastic factorial calculator, my base will need 450 megawatts of power, assuming I put efficiency modules in everything that will take them, which is equivalent to over 10,000 solar panels, so we want them producing as soon as. Whilst I wait for construction bots to finish researching, I head out to set up some mining to make my life easier. For now, I'm only building the miners themselves. I'll leave the rails and collection until I've decided on my train system for this run. Once construction bots are available, I instantly set up this system to top up the network to 400 bots. But once we start building properly, I will quickly increase this value. I spend some time setting up chunk aligned rails whilst personal robo parts research. Initially I intended to have four personal robo parts, but of course a mere five solar panels can't keep up with that, so I end up using two and filling the remaining space with more solar panels. With my new robot army, I set off to make a start on the rail system. I begin with this massive railroad serving as the spine of my central base. All of my smelting is going to be around this area, as well as probably some high volume materials. You can see the extent of it as I run down it here. Whilst I'm waiting for substations to research, I start designing solar arrays. 
ready for when they finish. The ideal ratio of solar panels to accumulators is 25 to 21, so I'm trying to get it close, but I'm not too stressed about getting it bang on. Despite that, I end up with this almost perfectly ratioed build, having only 0.8 too many accumulators, and I waste no time copying it down to give the bots some work to do. I decide that for fun, I'm going to try to fit smelting stacks into the tiny gap between these two railways. Fun in the same way of course, trapping your fingers in a car door is. It's only really entertaining for other people. I, with no thought at all, make the decision to have one to three trains in this base. If there is a good reason for it, that isn't why I decided for it to be this way. I discover that three red belts of smelting can fit into this space, which is in all honesty, surprisingly good. I quickly build the furnaces all out and then fill them up with efficiency modules before turning to the loading and unloading. We can just about, with some generous use of underground belts, extricate the resources from the unloading station into the inputs of the smelters. Getting the resources out on the other side is much simpler. The stone supply for the mall runs right through where I want to build my smelters, so I decide to run it through the gap between this set of smelting stacks and the next. Once I get the stone line out of the way, I can copy the smelters up here. So here is the finished module, providing 6 red belts of smelting. Now for our 480 kilo base, we need, uh, well, let's see, oh, ah, right, yeah, 14 of these. Fort fucking teen. It's a good job it's so tiny and there's all this space. So I copy another one down but quickly realise that there's not enough hours in a lifetime to build something this big out of my inventory and personal robo parts. So I connect up the robot network to it and let the swarm of construction bots chip away. After about an hour of land filling, belt rerouting and travelling through thick forest, I get all 14 modules blueprinted down. It's so big, some of it hasn't even been revealed by radar yet, though I promise there is blueprints there. Here's some footage of me driving through it to truly express the scale of this setup. Even with hundreds of construction bots and the entire mall at my disposal, this is likely to take hours, but in return it will be enough smelting to get us through to the rocket launch. I recorded setting up this iron outpost. But whilst the smelting setup gets built, I am going to do some work off camera to build outposts and clear biters. So we will return once that is finished. It was a while before I turned back on the recording. I didn't actually spend 10 hours. Some of it was AFK time warping to get some key researches. But the furnaces are done. Our base now runs exclusively on solar power. The biters are pushed back, although it will be difficult to push them back any further. And most importantly, I am ready and raring to get some actual trains going. I'm using Project Cybersyn for trains, so the first thing we need to set up is a depot for them all. I think 64 trains is a good starting point, so I build the depot to hold that many, as well as setting up rocket fuel to keep them fueled. I start to let some loose onto the system, which is as simple as setting them to automatic and sending them to a depot, from which Cybersyn will handle the rest. So far, these are the only mines connected up, which is nowhere near enough for the final base, but will be good enough for now to get some resources into the system. We can see here the first of many train deliveries to the furnace stacks, although it isn't as satisfying as it could have been, due to the stack inserters not quite yet being able to keep up with a red belt. So, we have iron, copper and steel now. I suppose all that's left is to find something to do with it. An obvious first step would be red science. Once we get the first two sciences set up, we'll be able to get rid of the big setup in the middle of the base, saving us space and pollution. The actual resource requirements for red science are minuscule, less than a red belt of each, so I didn't need to put much consideration into the actual building of the thing. Here's what it looks like in the end, and it is incredibly broken, as those of you with a keen eye will be able to see. I won't notice for a while, however, as our trains are too busy shoveling iron into the steel smelters to bother bringing any over here. There was some biter nests to the north, a bit too close to an iron and oil patch I wanted, so I head up to dispatch them. This also serves as an opportunity to show off my new method of destroying nests, as the turret creep 
was sucking away my soul. If you have, like me, never used poison capsules, you will be surprised to find out that they don't actually kill nests. So I used them to kill the worms and soften up biters before using a combination of rockets and defender capsules to kill the nests. The day that I graced these biters' village was the worst of their lives, but for me, it was Tuesday. With my bloodlust mostly satiated and a newfound clarity of mind, I returned to my red science setup and found that I absolutely wanked it up. Now, I could, and perhaps should, just rip this bottom bit down and redo it, but I instead go with this slightly jank but entirely functional solution and just resolve to never look at the thing again. In lieu of any proper oil outposts, I set up this simple little station that draws extra oil from the mall if we want to use any. Though there are a few easy to access oil patches I can hook up, given I can be bothered to do it. I then decide to set up green science, which again, due to its low resource requirements, doesn't need a particularly well designed train station, so I shove it into this little space here. You've seen this all before, except this time it's blue, so I won't dwell on it too much. Now, it's time to set up train stations to drop all this science off to the labs. The lab setup itself cannot handle six different science packs, but we're gonna build six stations anyway, because when we build out the final lab setup, we can just build it where this one was. I get the first two stations connected up to their respective inputs, and with that, a third of the final science production is finished. And that's where we are now. I've put a lot of hours in and brought us to this liminal point in the run, barely crossing the threshold into the final stages of the game. Next time, we're going to finish what we started here and completely replace our old base with this new one, as well as likely getting started on some new stuff. Until then, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. I just moved house recently and recording in my new office, I've found that it echoes like nothing else. So say hello to Cave Ryan, CEO of Echo Laboratories. If you are getting destroyed by biters, you should use poison capsules, explosive rockets, and a laser turret creep. Sun Tzu said that, and I suspect he knows a lot more about war than you do, considering he invented it. Sun Tzu, however, is dead, and has been for about two and a half thousand years, and he did not live to see the horrors of modern weaponry, most important of which being the console command. You see, when given the choice between the short term gratification of me getting this video out sooner, which didn't happen anyway, and the long term gratification of watching me truly suffer, my viewers gave me the easy way out, and I am forever grateful. I of course would never cheat in such a way, so I cleared out all the nests by hand. Here is an impartial source backing me up on that claim. In all seriousness, in the background is proof that I was not in some way deadlocked against the biters. I was certainly making some progress against them, but the time alone to clear out necessary biters to get the resources I needed is probably greater than the time I had spent previously in the run combined. I hope that this choice doesn't ruin the run for any of you, but the general consensus in the comments on the poll was that most people didn't care for the biters and were more interested in the base, so after a quick check that they are truly gone, I head back and get down to business winning the game. To aid in our great escape, we're going to need oil. Lots of oil. So much in fact, that we need 86 refineries and over a kilometre of pipes to provide it all, before we even get to the cracking and the oil products themselves. Due to this, and me foolishly failing to automate oil refineries or set up sufficient buffers for pipe production, I set up these two machines to help me handcraft. Handcrafting at 63 hours into the run. The area I decide on for this setup is in the massive empty area right above the labs, as I truly have no idea how much space it's going to take up, since I don't know how many train stations I'm going to need, and I generally want each train station to have at least one waiting spot, which theoretically should improve throughput, and hopefully help keep the belts and pipes saturated, I just build 10 waiting spots, because sounds like enough to me. This is the sort of design I end up with for the oil refineries, 3 rows of 29. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to do something like 5 rows of 18 or 6 rows of 15, as once the rails are put in, there is a massive amount of space above and below 
which I struggle to fill with anything. You will see in this build, and the green circuit build after it, that I was slightly inspired by Dosh Doshington's insane C block base, but I quickly realised I had neither the experience nor the finesse to truly replicate the feel, so I give up for the rest of the base afterwards. I cram an oil cracking setup into the space below the refineries, the astute among you will notice I failed to actually connect it up, and will not notice for some time. But if anything, it just makes that empty space feel so much bigger. I also get this loop set up, similarly not connected, but this one I don't notice until I'm making yellow science, which as you can guess, and you will soon see, is not any time in the near future. Still, thinking I'm the bee's knees in design, I try to fit the sulphur setup into this tiny gap, and it almost works if not for this ugly ass belt drooping over to the other side. I definitely need to improve my belt fill at some point in the future. What is he doing? He's beginning to believe. Next up is the redeeming feature of this entire god awful oil build, the plastic setup. In contrast to the rest of the thing, it is sleek, compact, and manageable to look at. Good build. The next thing we need is everyone's favourite resource sink, green circuits. The construction of this build was filled with plate, as I initially designed it thinking that I needed 20 assemblers per side to fill a red belt, when it is in fact 20 assemblers in total. You can see that only the first half of the build is actually doing anything. In probably my only non-biter related save scum ever, I go back to a point before the iron arrived, and therefore the setup activated, and chopped the second half off. I can then add the green circuit pickup station back on, and that's a quarter of our total green circuits. Don't do this splitting design at home, it seems to work fine whilst the station is saturated, but after enough time, will cause trains to have to wait in the station for a stupid long time. I can just copy this over to the right here, getting us up to half of our required green circuit production, and now I'm going to build another half above to finish this off. The whole setup ended up looking like this, which is unfortunate. Purge your dirty minds, you degenerates. It isn't fully saturated due to chronic train throughput issues plaguing the base, but it is doing something at least. The astute among you will have realised that I forgot sulfuric acid and batteries, so I attached this tumorous growth onto the side of the rail network to produce them. Thankfully, we don't need too many. The next and final big intermediate which is getting its own production area is of course everyone's favourite, red circuits. I built this big train station to bring in the resources, but what little old past me, this little guy living in blissful ignorance, didn't know was that I seemed to be incapable of reading the factorial calculator. You see, I opened up the Kirk Macdonald Factorio calculator and simply read this little value which tells me, oh, I need 8.3 red belts of copper plates to make the amount of red circuits I need. However, there is just one big glaring issue with this, being that red circuits aren't the only thing on here which require copper. Green circuits do too, and we're already making those elsewhere. If we look at the copper requirements for this many green circuits, we see that it needs 5 red belts of copper plates. So this red chips setup actually only needs 3.3 red belts of copper. God damn it. Once I finally came to this realisation, I had already built the whole thing out like this. So I ultimately just decided to pretend that one of the train stations didn't exist and turn the remaining 6 belts of copper into 4 using this balancer. The actual design for the red circuits you've probably seen a quillion times, just this time. It's big. Now that the big intermediates are out of the way, I can get around to making the sciences themselves. Since biters are off the table, the next science is blue, which needs these four resources as input, although none of them in such high quantity to require two train stations. The best thing you can do for yourself in a run like this is easily repeatable designs. For basically everything I build, I try to find a good fraction of the total required materials, build that fraction, and then just copy it however many times it's required. The engine setup and my red circuits were probably my peak in this regard. The rest of the ingredients we were already producing elsewhere, so I quickly move on to creating the science itself. Another repeatable simple design, I'm sure you can see why I'm glossing through most of this. If you look to the bottom left, you will notice that some copper has infected my sulphur supply, so I had to build a system to get it back out. 
Naturally, the next step is to build purple science, which needs a few more ingredient inputs. There is some method to how it's laid out, with stone, iron and steel grouped up for rails, then the steel, bricks and red circuits grouped up for electric furnaces, before finally the red and green circuits together for the productivity modules. Rails, I think, had a pretty nice design, as it isn't obvious how one is to get three belts of output from a setup like this. Basically, the first two thirds of the assemblers output into the middle and the rails are taken out the top, and then the last third's middle belts run out the bottom and the two are combined into a single belt which is brought round to the top getting us our required three red belts of rails. Electric furnaces are barely worth speaking about, requiring little materials or assembly machines. For productivity modules, I made the same mistake as I did with the red circuits earlier, as I counted the green circuits required to make the red circuits, as well as the green circuits for the productivity modules, meaning I had two belts of green circuits here, instead of the actually required one. Now it's as simple as bringing these three ingredients together and turning them into the mysterious purple fluid which fulfills all of our production technology needs. Before we can move on to our next and final science, we need to upgrade our lab setup to be able to accommodate all of them. I sever all of the incoming belts, and wiser than to think my personal robot parts could do this in a reasonable time frame, set up a temporary local robot network to deconstruct the old setup for me. The new design is nothing particularly special, it doesn't have to be, with only 6 sciences to feed into it. Speaking of 6 sciences, all we have left now is the little piss bottles that are utility science. Utility science is the biggest of the bunch, requiring 10 train stations and a massive amount of production for each and every ingredient. We begin with a low density structure, which needs 3 of these very massive, but very boring setups. One of my main gripes with vanilla is that for the most part at this stage in the game, every solid to solid crafting recipe looks very similar. Whilst in the process of building LDS however, I discover a massive deadlock, gooing up the arterial rails at the heart of my base, the smelting stack over which the entire train system crosses. If I could do one thing over with this playthrough, it would be a better design of the rails as the terrible mess I created caused me more problems in this run than anything else. All of this caused by me neglecting to separate my sides of the tracks when they crossed. Do not repeat my mistake. Anyway, back to the yellow science. I have never laid belts and felt such satisfaction as I did creating this. I felt like a robot printing a circuit. Except watching back over, if I were, I would likely be sacked and find myself pile driven into a dumpster due to the number of mistakes I constantly made. It is rare I stand still long enough when recording to get footage like this of a setup filling up. Robot frames exist, but are not particularly pleasing to look at, so I will happily gloss over them. For blue circuits, I build this pretty little thing before copying it eight times, leading to this pretty big thing, and it's quite cool pattern with the green circuits on the belt pulsing. I kind of lost inspiration for the piss bottle production. It's just 38 assemblers in a row on either side, taking off a central belt. You have to understand that this was essentially the final build of this odyssey of suffering, and I was ready to have it over and done with. But, once the first delivery finally reaches the labs, all that stands between me and victory is time, and outposts. Lots of outposts. The outpost building itself is nothing special, so I've skipped out on it, but I also did some more stuff in the background to tune this well-oiled machine we have going. The most important of which was to do with trains. As it turns out, I had more than enough trains, but most of them were wasting their time with only half full loads due to Cybersyn. I will probably do a full tutorial for Cybersyn in the future, because it is such a powerful and useful mod. But if I were to give you one tip now, it would be to use request thresholds on everything, so that only fully loaded trains are requested, because every partially filled train out on the rails is wasted throughput. Anyway, enough of me nattering, whilst the rocket research finishes, enjoy an overview of the base.
As the rocket research closes in on completion, I gather all of the necessary resources for the silo and rocket itself together in this central area, as well as setting up a dirty bit of hand-fed rocket control units, because it's easier than setting up proper production. Once the research does finish, I get the silo quickly crafted up and placed, putting us in the home stretch. It isn't long before it finishes crafting. Before I can quite launch it though, I first of course go and run the victory lap on the members of my Discord server. I go and grab a car, place it in the cargo hold, hop in and escape from this dreadful place. Special thanks to my Ko-Fi supporters, Zachaha Quack, Acrid Arsonist, Dragonium, Arom, Watcher, Mocha Fett, Scuvy, Dick Dastardly Enthusiast, Das Tom, Dr. Duck Lumps, Shrank Hoovy, Leo, Preston Cole, Thomas, Moon Runes, Michael Shoning, Sukares, Pubic Tuft, The Fiendish, Nathan14321, Stocky, Superintendent, Hey1121, Niche Dev, and Justice.